So let's go ahead and go get started with the next session. I will very briefly introduce the individual who is moderating this session, Dr. Rob Califf, who's currently our Deputy Commissioner for Medical Products and Tobacco. Thanks, Steve. Let's see, what I need is a program. Do you have one? <laughs> Great. Um, I mean, as, as uh, many of you know, my life has taken an unusual ch uh, turn over the last several weeks. So I've been on and off the uh, program, I think, five or six times because um, I'm meeting individually with the senators that are on the help committee now. And um, as I've learned, I am just um, at the behest of the senators whenever they can meet with me. So I'm really excited that... Um, the schedule suddenly cleared up because I wasn't planning on being here. Steve was going to have to sub. But um, as, as many of you also know, this is a topic that's really uh, dear to my heart. And I'm looking forward to learning a lot uh, from today's um, panelists. As I look at um, just a reflection on my experience so far at the FDA, um, you know, I think all of you know that over the course of an average day at the FDA, hundreds of decisions are being made. Most of them no one hears about, and most of them, thank God, Steve, I know you've told me this many times, never come to the even awareness of the commissioner and the commissioner's office because a very competent job is being done. But among the things that do come to the level of the commissioner and the commissioner's office, a very high proportion, um, I would argue, are because we simply have inadequate evidence. And then you're in a realm where decisions have to be made, and it's a matter of opinion. And when we're dependent on opinions for decisions about issues related to health, um, I'm guessing that the vast majority of people in the room would, would agree with me that that's a place we'd rather not be. Having opinions about good data, is a, in my view, is a whole different um, argument that happens on a whole different plane that's much, typically much more civil, where you have good data people may value the data differently from different cultures or different perspectives. So I think one of the most important things that we can all be doing in regulatory science is figuring out um, what's in this um, topic. And I'm really good. We've got a bunch of um, real experts, many of whom I've worked with um, over the years to talk about. And Martin, you're, you're first up. Martin Landry, I just want, just want to say a word about Martin. Um, you know, he's from a lineage, which is um, I've been uh, working with and competing with for many years in my uh, life as a clinical trialist. But there's no question that the uh, lineage from uh, Oxford has really taught us a lot about how to simplify. And now along comes Martin, who not only is a great collaborator across the ocean, but in addition to that, he's running a big data center in a place which is famous for one-page case report form. So I'm really looking forward to hearing how uh, Martin will put all this together. Thanks very much. Um, yes, I mean, uh, the back, my background is quite simple, really. I'm a clinician, so on a Wednesday morning, I see one patient at a time and think about one problem at a time. The rest of the time, I run clinical trials, so I tend to think of the people by the 10,000, and I think of typically one hypothesis at a time. And then my newer life in big data uh, revolves around not ten, one patient or 10,000, but typically hundreds of thousands or millions, and quite often thinking of very, about many uh, questions all at the same time. But I'm going to really uh, focus down on what I think big data, which is shorthand for a lot of things, means slightly different things to a lot of people, but it, most people tend to listen to it, what big data means in the, sen in the setting of randomized controlled trials. So I think that perhaps the greatest value it can give us is around the range of information it can provide around phenotype. It can allow us to collect uh, information on uh, traditional clinical outcomes more efficiently. Perhaps that's clinical outcomes which we can collect from registries, from primary and secondary care, electronic health care records, and so on and so forth, so forth. Symptoms, quality of life, uh, angina severity, degree of breathlessness, and so on and so forth. Perhaps thinking a little bit greater about the economic and social consequences of disease and the impact of treatment. 
So what might the impact be on childhood education? What might be the impact of disease and its treatment on the ability to return to work and lead a functional life, either for the individual or for the family or the wider context? There are also novel assessments of traditional disease features. So, for example, exercise capacity, maybe we can move away from the uh, slightly stereotypical six-minute walk to something that is more representative and more relevant to the particular patient population we're, we're setting. And likewise with cognitive function, maybe we can move away from simple questionnaires of can you remember who the Prime Minister is, which is not an easy question to answer, if I ask you the UK version, who is the monarch, that is considerably more difficult to answer. And if I ask the Canadians, who is your head of state, very few will, will uh, answer. It's Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland and the, United, and the Commonwealth. So there are uh, exercise, uh, so, uh, new ways of collecting informative cognitive data and likewise for extending physiological assessments way beyond the controlled environment into a much less controlled environment, particularly using things like sensors and camera-based measurements, even of things like oxygen saturation, which we would uh, typically consider to be require some sort of probe um, or actually uh, invasive measurements. And then finally, there's the novel assessment of new endpoints. The things that patients tell us matter but we don't measure and put into our regulatory decision making because we don't know how to measure them. So things like tremor or sensor uh, uh, or, or movement disorder, or for children perhaps, keystroke speed and the ability to play interactive computer games might be a really critical component of the difference between living happily with a disorder and living miserably with a disorder. And it actually is something that perhaps we ought to be taking into consideration and bringing into that uh, weighing of evidence. So big data. I use a variation of this slide whenever I'm talking about big data. In this case, it's for reliable evaluation of treatment effects. I do think it covers scale, the number of participants, the number of outcomes, getting good power for moderate treatment effects. Breadth, the diverse populations, whether that's uh, comorbidity, uh, concomitant treatment, uh, or thinking about adverse effect, effect uh, profiles. The duration, think about time. Many of our assessments are snapshots in time. A diagnostic assessment is a single picture. Uh, and quite often, our clinical trials are either too short or fail to account of measurement variability over time. And then depth. To what extent do we need to characterize and differentiate between outcomes as opposed to lump and uh, uh, bring together uh, many different uh, components? And both approaches can be, can be uh, useful. Now the technology allows us at least not to be limited by the technology and the onus is on us to think about the science. One thing I would say though is with all the hype and all that promise, the fundamental principles of large-scale randomized trials remain unaltered. So I want to turn to my major theme, which builds on the biomarker discussion we had this morning. And this is around what do we mean by getting accurate data, reliable results? What sort of errors can we cope with? Well, an obvious recap for all of those in the room and beyond. Random errors simply add noise. They reduce power. They minimize a difference. If you're trying to say my treatment's better than yours, they're conservative. If you're trying to say my treatment's just as safe as yours, they're counter-conservative. If you're doing a non-inferiority trial, they're counter-conservative. Think about what you're trying to assess, the interpretation you're trying to put, and then think about random errors. But you do not get bias in one direction or the other. It doesn't, we don't swing to one arm or the other. Systematic errors are much, much more problematic, and if you introduce significant, significant um, systematic errors, you might as well have not bothered doing a randomized trial in the first place. So I'm going to give you some examples which illustrate that actually size and uh, reliability of results uh, do not necessarily require perfect data. I'm going to turn to the observational world. This is a simple example. This is a relationship between blood pressure, just measured in the clinic, and dying from heart disease, just measured on the death certificate. Crude data. This is what you have if you look at 5,000 people. This is in different age groups, and we, we broadly know that those with higher blood pressure are at higher risk. It's actually remarkably difficult to tell from this picture. And all I want to know is, in my mother's generation, does that pattern hold true as well as it does in my own age group? 
If I scale up to 50,000 people, the picture begins to become clearer. If I scale up to half a million people, these are mechanical engineering diagrams. These are normograms that you can read off. And I haven't changed the quality of the data from left to right. All I've changed is the scale, and in each case, I've been careful about my analytical approach. Second example is around outcome ascertainment and adjudication. And what I want to think about, a lot of people worry about what happens if we include a few false results. We need to adjudicate to strip out all that noise. Or what happens if we miss a load of, inf of important uh, events? I'm thinking here of superiority, superiority and efficacy outcome. So if we start off with the truth, which is 800 versus 1,000, active versus control. That gives us an odds ratio of 0.78. There's the Z score over on the right-hand side. And to cut a long story short, if we had extra false events just introduced at random at, say, the 10% rate, the numbers would go up, the odds ratio would more or less stay the same, the z-score, the p-value, the, the statistical significance would stay the same. 20% extra events on this sort of scale, really no impact on any form of regulatory decision or clinical decision. What would happen if we missed some events? You see a very similar pattern. So if you have large numbers and you're looking for superiority, it's remarkable how resistant to that error, that missingness or misclassification that randomized trials can be. Of course, many of us fall into the problem that actually we don't randomize these sorts of numbers. And the question is then, if not, why not? I'm going to leave rare diseases to the following speakers, but I would argue that in common diseases, common diseases are common. Whatever puts it, it barriers are put in the way from randomizing effectively, those are the things we need to address. So does that translate into practice? This is the heart protection study results. I and a colleague spent a year of our life adjudicating 30,000 clinical events. These are the results. Uh, a risk reduction for major vascular events of about 24%, highly statistically significant, uh, highly clinically significant, every, regulation, uh, um, every uh, drug approval change, clinical practice change, and so on. What if I hadn't bothered? I'd have got these results. Highly statistically significant, a risk reduction of 23%, not 24%, highly statistically significant. And I'd argue that you would have thought that every other uh, um, iteration, the clinical impact and the regulatory impact would be the same. Of course, we do know that regulators would frown upon this and be quite and smile when they see this. No clear reason. <laughs> if we turn then to what about we use routine data? Well, this is from the uh, Women's Health Initiative. This is not, not my data. Um, and uh, the, they, uh, in this study of uh, hormone replacement therapy, uh, looked at the impact of hormone replacement therapy on cardiac events. The top line in each in instance is what happened when they got the fully adjudicated trial data. You can see the hazard ratios over here. What would happen if they just used routine data from CMS? They'd have got exactly the same answer. So all this stuff about we need perfect data, data standardization, et cetera, et cetera, all very helpful. Lovely if you have it. Remember, today's innovation is tomorrow's legacy system. So you always have to cope with legacy. We get the same answers. We, this allows us to assess over time, in this case back to the heart protection study, for very small costs, 10-year efficacy of simvastatin, costing us about, at that time about £200,000, $300,000 for five years of extended follow-up. And what about safety? You must need perfect information for safety. This is simply information on self-reports, not adjudicated, of serious adverse events in the Thrive trial, which is of uh, niacin loropraprant. And what you can see is a significant excess in a number of factors, including infection and bleeding, never described before, not occurred through any form of pharmacovigilance or post-marketing surveillance, and the ER niacin has been around for 50 plus years and uh, unfortunately continues to be used. I'm getting a signal saying the time's up. I don't believe it because the, the clock's still on zero and there's no lights. So I think... <laughs> <laughs> So if, I, if that's not right, how do I know that's right? <laughs> so I will finish. There are some significant new challenges. There are challenges of information governance. <laughs> One side. Is information governance, there are technical issues, there are methodological issues, but there are key implications for regulatory science, particularly as we start to think about what do these new technologies mean around new endpoints, not surrogate endpoints, not biomarkers, but actually new endpoints, and how do we uh, ascertain those? And there are substantial challenges 
around good clinical practice and removing the barriers that the current forms of good clinical practice of one guideline of one sort or another currently impose. I'll stop there. Thank you. That was great.